Hey everybody, in this video, I'm gonna take you through an intro to N8N. So I'm gonna show you how to sign up, what your hosting options are, how you navigate this place, and even take you through a quick intro of building our first AI agent so you can understand how modules work, how we manipulate data, and what it means for you. So let's get started. First of all, what does it mean that this is a low code platform that allows us to make AI agents? So here's a look at my personal AI agent that acts as my assistant. So when we talk about low code, what we mean is that all of this was built primarily with no code involved. And behind each of these modules, there is code in the background, primarily laying chain, but we don't need to code to build these things. Instead, we simply create these modules, we give them different parameters, we hook them up, and then when we run it, the code in the background is doing its thing, but we never have to interact with it. So it allows us to be in the space of AI agents and AI automations and AI workflows without having years and years of skills built up in the coding space, which is great for us. Now we call it low code and not no code because there are instances where we do use code, like you see something here. Now it tends not to be very complex and we lean heavily on AI when we create this code, right? We simply go to either ask AI here and explain what we want, or we go into something like ChatGPT, explain our problem, explain what we're trying to do, and we get the code from there. But at no point are we the ones who are actually going in there and writing lines of code. It's just not necessary inside of n So that's what low code means. And now let's talk about actually getting signed up with NADN.io. So first of all, you'll get to this page. And the first thing you're gonna do is just go to the get started and create an account. You can do a free trial for two weeks, but what you're gonna see very quickly is pricing, right? You're looking at 20 bucks a month annually, 24 if you do monthly. But if you've been in this space for any amount of time, you've probably seen people reference stuff like self-hosting or local hosting, and what the heck does that mean? So when we talk about hosting, what we're saying is, where is NADN running? Now, if you go through the default screen and you go through the pricing and select the plan, you're gonna be over here on the left. You're gonna be using NADN's cloud. Now, it's gonna be their official NADN service. It's the easiest to set up. You're just a few clicks away, but it is the most expensive, right? You're either paying 20 to 24 bucks a month to use their product. So we also have the option to self-host and local host. Now, NADN is actually an open source platform. That means I don't have to go through NADN to actually use their service. I can actually take their code and bring it to another cloud provider like DigitalOcean, Railway, or Render and host it there and use their product. And I also have the option to local host, which means I don't even go to a third party cloud provider. Local host means I have it on my actual computer and I run it there essentially for free. And so when we talk about price, like we said, NADN Cloud, you're looking at about 20 to 24 bucks. Self-hosting can go from anywhere from, you know, $0 at the lowest end all the way up to, you know, $25, $50 a month if you want more power. But for an equivalent, you know, power as the cloud, it's probably going to cost you 5 to $10. So that's significant savings. And then local hosting, as we said, is essentially free, but you're just paying for electricity or if you have your own servers, there's obviously those costs as well. Now, we also need to mention that you are using the community version, that open source version, if you're self-hosting or local hosting versus the official cloud version if you go through NNN. Now, it's about 95, 96% the same. And in some instances, there's actually advantages to using the community version of NNN. You actually get access to community nodes and modules, essentially custom modules that members of the community have made. But this is a decision I suggest you make rather early. I have videos in my school of how to self-host if that's something you want to do. But feel free when you first get started to just use the free trial version, right, of NADN Cloud. Do it for 14 days, kind of get your feet under you, and then make a decision about what you want to do. And truth be told, if self-hosting and local hosting just seem like way too complex and not in your wheelhouse, don't be afraid to just go on the month plan. Do a month of the NADN Cloud. Do two months of NADN. Because truthfully, self-hosting isn't too difficult. And whatever stuff you make in the NADN cloud won't be too hard to transfer over to your self-hosted instance of NADN. So you aren't stuck on one path forever if that's what you decide to do. So once you log in, you'll be on the overview page. And this is where you can see the workflows you have, the credentials, and even executions. So workflows are the different AI agents and automations you've created. Credentials are all the different services you're signed up for. So like your Google accounts, you know, your GitHub, your Discord all those things. And then executions are, hey, here's different, you know, workflows that you've run. Here's if they were successful. Here's if they were failures. You can actually go in and check on those. 
And then over here on your left, you have all the different admin stuff to access your profile, right? Change different settings, all that good stuff. But what we care about right now is being able to get in there and create a workflow. So you're going to come up here and hit create workflow. So here we are inside the canvas, and this is where we're going to create all of our AI workflows. So you're always going to see this thing that says add first step. So you can either click on that or you can also hit tab. And the first thing we need to do is create some sort of trigger. That's what's going to start our workflow. So we're just going to search for the chat trigger. Right. And now we have the ability to actually talk with whatever we hook this up to. So I can talk with this by either hitting the open chat here or coming down there. And so if I say hi, right, we'll see that this module executed, right? It has a green check mark, it has a green outline, it's all good to go. We're able to add modules by just hitting the plus button here and then searching for whatever we wanted to add it to. Now you'll see all the different options over here and there's actually a ton of them, right? Right here, tons of different tools. We have the ability to do like some AI tools. And frankly, it can be kind of overwhelming to dive through all these and understand what am I supposed to do? That's just gonna come with time and experience. But what we are gonna start is we're gonna start with an AI agent. So we search for AI agent, we'll get something that looks like this. And now we can actually chat with an AI. But first we need to actually hook up a model to it. So this thing has some sort of brain. So to do that, really simple, we're just gonna hit the plus on the chat model and you'll see all the different AI models we can hook it up to. So for this, we're going to use OpenAI. It tends to be the most popular, but feel free to do whichever one you want. And so what you have to do is you need to create a credential. Now to do that, you're just gonna click here, hit create new credential. And what you'll see here and what you should be looking at anytime you get confused is something that says docs or open docs, right? So one of the great things about N8N is their documentation. If you've ever used any sort of technical documentation before, you understand that oftentimes it hurts you more than it helps because of how confusing and arcane it is. But N8N does a really good job of explaining stuff step by step so you can do it and not get kind of lost along the way. So we're gonna use the documents to connect our OpenAI account. So again, to generate an API key, we just need to log into our OpenAI account or create an account. So you can click the link here. Now log in or create one. So I did that. And then next we need to go to our API keys page. Click the link here. And here we are with our API keys. So from here, we just create a new key. Um, we'll call this, you know, project doesn't matter create a secret key and here's our key now we want to copy this now of note if you've never created an api key before you actually do that you're going to want to go into your billing and so to do that come up here to the right click this little gear that says settings go to billing and add some funds to your account you want to add the funds before you create the api key because sometimes if you use an api key that you've never had any funds for it can get a little wonky and if you did that already no problem just go back to the api key and create another one as for how much money you should put in here five bucks is plenty and then once you have your api key just come back here paste it in you can leave the base url the same hit save and it will connect your account so now that you have your account set up, now we have to actually pick what model we want to use. And this list is both exhausting and extremely confusing. So the answer to what model you use is it depends and it changes pretty much weekly. The model I would have suggested a week ago is frankly a different one than I will suggest today. Now today, as of what, April, what you should be looking for is the 4.1 series. Now the 4.1 series is for API only, which is fine for us. And what you probably want to use is either the 4.1 mini or the 4.1 nano because it's fast and it's cheap. And if you're wondering how much does it cost, well, just go to something like perplexity and simply say, hey, can you give me a breakdown of the cost between the models and which model should I be using for this task? Now, something like the 4.0 nano is using fractions of a penny for calls like this. And oftentimes when you see pricing, it's going to be in terms of 1 million tokens as an output or an input. What does 1 million tokens equate to? Well, that's like 1 million words. So for Nano, I believe it's 40 cents per 1 million tokens is like the output. So very, very cheap. And we're gonna use that for now. So we've now connected a brain to our AI agent. Now let's do some memory. And we're just gonna use simple memory because it's the easiest. When we do things that are more sophisticated, we have the ability to actually connect full-blown databases. And here we see context window length. We're going to keep it to five, which essentially means it's going to remember our last five messages. And so 
what you have now is like a very basic version of ChatGPT, right? So I can chat with it and say, hey, how's it going? And I'll actually get a response that's also tied to the memory. So let's kind of break down what we're seeing inside of NADN right now. So obviously we have our chat. And then over here we have our log. So I can actually see what kind of route the data put, right? First it went to the memory, then it went to the chat model. We can see the output, and then it put that back into the memory. We can also see that everything worked, right? We have green check marks on every single module that was used. And if I click into the AI agents, we can kind of see the same thing, right? We had our input over here on the left, right? That's the data we started with. We have the module we care about and its interactions. And then we have our logs that we talked about before and our actual output. Now, this is a very simple example, and this obviously seems quite obvious, but the ability to understand inside of NADN where my data started, where it's being manipulated, and what the output actually is, is very, very important because as these become more and more sophisticated, right? If we're looking at something like this, understanding where data started, where it's getting executed at and where it outputs is vital for us to not only troubleshoot, but to create workflows that actually make sense and do what we want them to do. So on that note, let's actually dive into this thing a little bit more. Again, what's happening over here on the left? Well, this is the input, right? That's the chat. And now we're looking at the AI agent module, and this is where we can manipulate the settings to change things. So we have our parameters, and this is where you're going to spend most of your time. There's also a settings option, but this tends to be a little more advanced. I wouldn't worry about it too much right now. And so again, we also have our docs, like we talked about before, and then we'll go into detail about how it works, issues, and those sorts of things. And when it comes to AI, like large language models and agents, we're often going to see source for prompt. Now, source for prompt is exactly what it sounds like. Where is the prompt coming from? It's going to default to our connected chat trigger node, which is this guy, and it's saying, hey, whatever comes from here is going to be what we use from the prompt. But we could change that, right? And oftentimes we will. Oftentimes there'll be something that we put here ourselves, right? We define below. And so now let's talk about how I can map things. So what if I wanted the prompt to actually be the session ID? Now, that would essentially just be a list of numbers that's going to the system, and that doesn't make a ton of sense. But you can see that it doesn't always have to be the connected chat trigger node. It can kind of be anything, right? And so I could have this be the chat output which is essentially the same thing before, but now I have a little more control and customization as to what is actually going into this AI module. And this is something you're gonna do a lot. This, this whole idea of mapping actions in previous modules and putting in the one you're working with is something you need to understand inside of NADN. So if it's green, that means the map is working and oftentimes we'll show down here what that actually looks like. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is the system message. So system messages are just the like custom instructions that the AI agent is working with behind the scenes. When you talk with ChatGPT normally, it has its own system message. You just don't interact with it, right? And the default one is you are a helpful assistant. And the way it works is it takes the prompt from the user. In this case, it's that chat input. Hey, how is, how's it going? And then it references its system message to understand how it needs to respond. So if I change the system message to something like, you need to always sound like Shakespeare, right? Something ridiculous like that and I now test the step, we'll see, right, the output changed to greetings, good sir, ma'am, how doth the fair with thee this fine day, pray tell me how goeth thy endeavors, right? So system messages are also extremely important because while we care about the data that comes into here, oftentimes it's all, the, the point of it all is how do we manipulate it and the way we manipulate that data and the rules and logic we give the AI is going to be here inside the system message. And this can get quite complicated. Going into something like this, right? Look at all the tools on, that is connected to this guy. How does it know which tool to call in what order? What's the logic behind it all? Well, if we dive into here, we'll see a system prompt that kind of breaks down how I want it to work, right? So that sort of internal logic, that's what's coming here in the system message. And in our simple example, we're just saying, hey, I want you to sound like Shakespeare from now on. And so some other things to note, like you saw before, I'm able to test the step this easily with different things. And we also have the ability to like pin data. So let's say um, I got an output I wanted and I just wanted to use that output from now on and I didn't want to constantly run test step. I could pin this data right here 
And now this is always going to be there, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense now. It'll make more sense later when you start doing more complex stuff. But that's how we pin data. I also have the ability to put like fake data here, right? So we have when chat message is received, right? That's right here. But what if I wanted to change it to something else? I can edit these outputs, right? I can come up to this pencil mark and change things right here, save it, and also pin it in that same way. So that's how pinning works. Now, if you're wondering why these are now, you know, kind of this yellow color, it's because we changed something and we haven't either run it or saved it. Okay, so now I know how I can set a trigger. I know I can hook up AI and how the kind of data moves from left to right. Well, what if I wanted to do something with this data? Or what if I wanted to add in some tools for the AI to work with? Well, let's try that. So if we hit tool here, you'll see you have access to all of these like native tools that are already hooked up inside of NNN. Now, for most of these, you have to kind of go through the same process we did with OpenAI, which is like going through the documentation and connecting your account. But for this, we'll use a very simple one that doesn't require us to do any of that, and that's Wikipedia. Okay. No, no real settings, no real parameters, but it's going to be good for our purposes here. So now, not only can we chat with our AI agent, right? It can now actually call on a different tool. So if I talk to it and I say, hey, can you give me the latest AI trends in 2025, um, according to Wikipedia, let me run this we'll see that it actually now calls this tool. And we can see this in real time, right? We get those green check marks, but we can also look here in the logs, right? And we can see what prompt it gave us. And now it gives us a whole breakdown on AI in 2025 as if it was Shakespeare. Cool, right? And again, we see where our data came from, right? In the input, we have our module that we've been manipulating, what the data is actually doing inside of it. And then we see our output over here. And from here, you can kind of do whatever you want, right? Let's say I wanted to eventually send this off via Gmail. You know, I'm not going to go through the whole process of linking this account. You can do that if you want through the docs. Um, I also have a video on that in my school. But when we talk about, you know, what do you want to get? No, I want to send a message. Remember how we talked a little bit about mapping data? Well, now we have that output coming from the AI agent over here. Well, I want that to be the message. How do I do that? Well, I would take it. I would drag it, and now it always knows every time I run this, hey, you're going to take that output from the AI agent and make that the message. So now let's talk a little bit more about this edit end environment. So right here, we're inside the editor, right? We also have this thing called executions. And if I click on that, I'm able to look at previous runs we've done. So each time I execute this, I can go through and I can kind of look at what happened, how fast it was, and if it succeeded or if it was an error. Um, and of note, if I see something like this and I want to edit it, you can either copy it to editor and it'll bring you back to that instance in that point in time, but you have to actually go back to editor to change things. So that's executions. You'll be looking at that a lot of times when you run into errors and you're trying to figure out where exactly stuff went wrong. Now, if you want to save this real simple, you need to hit save. Understand there's no auto save. So if you did a ton of work for a few hours and then clicked out of it, you're kind of out of luck. And now let's say I wanted to run this for real and I had like a schedule trigger here, for example. And every day I wanted it to check Wikipedia for new stuff about AI news and send it to me. Not only would I need to save it, right? I would need to come up here and click active and then it would actually run every single day and be in production. Some other things of note here. We have the ability to download this entire file. So if I download this, this workflow, and I open this up, we can sign it, we can kind of see the code that's behind the scenes and it's in JSON format. So here's a look at all that code that's working, you know, behind our modules, right? And so we were able to download it. Now, why do I care about being able to download it? Because I'm actually able to upload it as well. So you could download it, you could give it to someone else, but what's more likely is you use something that someone else has built. And let's say we want to import from file. We then find the file we want, we open it up and boom, we now have someone else's workflow ready to go. And then we can go in there and edit stuff as we need. So being able to import templates, download templates, it's all done from these three buttons up here. So that does it for this intro to edit end video. Hopefully that gave you a little bit better of a foundation going into more complicated AI workflows. So let me know what you think if you have any more questions and I'll see you around.